question for you. I was wondering about this. Can you think back to a conversation that you have had with somebody that you left feeling like they really saw you, like they really got you? You know what that was? That was the feeling of joy. That was the joy that comes from the richness of connection. And we're going to talk about that today because, you know, if, if World Unity Week is important to us, and obviously it is way beyond the week that we are sharing right now, it's important that we know how to go about finding unity and cultivating things that bring us together. And joy is one of those things. Let me tell you who I am and why this matters so much to me. My name is Robin Shear, and I am a joy coach. I might be the only joy coach you ever meet. I guess it depends. And um, I can tell you about my story later, but the relevant thing here is I am called to help people to know what joy is, how to go about getting it, and where to find it, and then helping people make it happen. And so one of the things that I really want to do today is help you to understand what joy is and what joy isn't, because you may find that this is a word that gets tossed around a lot in culture, and it's in music, and it's in poetry, and, and all kinds of research. And one of the interesting things that you may notice is that it's often confused with happiness. And in culture, you know, we're told to go after happiness. And I don't want anyone to watch this and think right from the start that I am bashing happiness. I am not at all. I hope that you have tons of happiness, but I hope that you don't stop there because happiness is a beautiful, but very temporary and fleeting feeling. It's a response that we get to a situation, a circumstance, a stimuli, you know? So for example, if you are opening your drawer and you're pulling on a pair of shorts that you haven't put on since last year and they fit, yay, happiness, that feels so good, right? Good for you, I hope that you have those moments. But if your focus is on happiness, you will find that there are moments that you feel good and then moments that that goes away and, and you don't feel as good and you're continually chasing this thing. And, and it is a bit like being on a roller coaster. What I want for you, and this is why I'm a joy coach, I want for you to have joy and you need to know what it is. Joy is a richer, deeper, lasting inner effervescence for life itself. It's more of a, it's more of a way of being than a way of feeling. Joy is not necessarily a response to something in our environment, although it can be, but so often it's just that thing that gives us resilience when life stinks and when life is messy. And, and we can find that, you know, we can get through those tough times. It gives us hope and it gives us purpose. And I would love so much for us to spend our time together, just kind of cultivating that figuring out where that might come from. And then I've got some specific examples. I've got some stories that I want to share with you that might kind of bring this home. I know I could share facts all day, but the juice is really in the stories. So I'll definitely get to those. So, but one of the things, you know, that I always ask my audiences is, okay, if joy and happiness are different, similar, but different, where do you on a personal level find joy? And what has been so interesting and truly beautiful is I have asked people around the world, what brings joy to you? And, and people will come up with a list. And, and so often we have to sort of separate out the things that are our sources of happiness, right? Because there is sort of that confusion. So if it's something that is temporary or, you know, circumstantial, we, we put that on the happiness list. So things like chocolate and, you know, money, those go over on the happiness list, but the joy list, that tends to be filled with things like gratitude, you know, really feeling thankful. For some people, joy is found in faith. And, and there are so many ways that that can bring joy. For some people, joy is found in giving, you know, and being generous and caring for other people and, and meeting the needs of other humans. And, and so the list grows. And when I ask people this question around the world, the thing that I love the most 
is how nobody has ever had the same list ever. They may have a couple of similarities, but the list in full has never been duplicated. So I've asked people in Asia and Africa, what brings you joy? I've talked to people in Europe. I have even talked to people in Ohio and none of these people have the same list. And the reason that I bring this up is because I want you to have permission because your friends may share what brings joy to them and your family. And you may feel like you should feel joy from this thing. And you need to know that you are as unique and as individual and as beautiful as anyone else on the planet. And your list doesn't have to match anybody. So I want you to just really dig into the things that light you up, even if no one else gets it, that is okay. And so as we have this conversation, you know, things may come to mind for you that you hadn't really thought of before as sources of joy, things that really fill you up. And I want you to just stop what we're doing and write those things down. If you've got access to a phone, make a list in your phone, piece of paper, a napkin, anything. But I want you to remember what comes up because the idea here is awareness. If we're really aware of the things that fill us up and bring meaning to our lives, then we can be more intentional about incorporating those into our day-to-day -day living. And the reason, here's where it gets really good and where I get really excited. The reason that we do this isn't for selfish reasons. Yeah, it does make us feel good. I mean, let's be honest. It feels good to feel good. And if you follow me on social media, like you'll hear me say that all the time. It's true. So we do go after joy to feel good, but we don't stop there because joy is contagious. I mean, this stuff is, it multiplies. So, you know, if you are at a grocery store in line and the person in line in front of you is filled with joy. Oh, you're going to know like that person will not be able to contain it and keep it to themselves. And before long, you'll be checking out your produce and you'll feel different because you will have absorbed some of that joy. It is so contagious. So, you know, my mission is to reach the world with this message of joy, making us feel good and joy being something we need to share. And if you want to talk about unity, oh, let me tell you, <laughs> sharing joy is one of the most beautiful ways to be united with another human being. And, you know, there's so many things that bring joy to us. And one of those things, one of the things that I think is probably kind of universal is connection. It really brings a rich joy to most people. And again, I can't speak for the entire, you know, global population, but connection you know that that feeling that you get when somebody truly sees you for who you are and and wants more of it and is interested and makes you feel like you matter like you have value and and so you know you can understand how feeling that on a personal level is wonderful but giving that to someone is even more wonderful. You're giving a gift to someone by, by showing them you matter so much. I want to connect with you. You both experience the joy of connection. And so, you know, I was thinking about some of the times in my own life that I have experienced connection with people. And it was kind of interesting as I thought through some of my favorite experiences, because I noticed there was a common denominator. You know what it was? This was kind of surprising to me. It was the people that I was most drawn to and felt the deepest connection with were actually quite down and out at the time. In fact, a lot of these individuals were ignored by others around them. And, and I think in some cases probably even felt somewhat invisible. And maybe that made them hungrier for connection, maybe that allowed for the joy to be richer. I don't know, but all I know is the memories that I have of connecting with people who were down and out are some of my favorite memories. And so I'm gonna share some stories with you now as they come up and, and I just want you to sort of imagine that you were there 
or let this remind you of situations that you have been in, either as the person reaching out or as the person receiving the joy. And, and just go back in your mind and allow yourself to feel those feelings again, because what will happen is you'll, you'll feel inspired to continue doing this, whether through your memories or me sharing my memories. The whole point here is if we can get excited about the unity that we feel when we share connection with someone, we'll want to keep doing it. And, and then we start spreading more joy. So the first story that really came to mind when I thought about this joy of connection was um, in Nicaragua, actually, I live in the United States. And um, at the time I was working at a church and it was time for our teenagers that I was in charge of to go on a mission trip. And it was the first ever international mission trip that our teens were allowed to go on in the history of our church. And I was the leader. Now, I need you to know that I was scared to death because I never had a foreign language class in high school or college. And so <laughs> if you want to talk about unity, I really would have been able to unite with more people if I'd spoken their language. And so I was a little intimidated by the idea of leaving an English speaking country and, and going someplace where I really couldn't communicate. So I spent a couple of years researching, you know, safety and all of these different options and experiences and all this stuff. And I, and I found a mission trip I was really excited about in Nicaragua, a place I had never been. And they obviously speak Spanish in Nicaragua. And I was really nervous about that because I wanted so badly to connect with the people. I mean, this wasn't a mission trip where we were just swooping in and rescuing people. It wasn't like that at all. It was service with the individuals who were receiving the work effort they were invested, we were invested, and we were partners. And we got to work side by side with these wonderful villagers in remote parts of Nicaragua. And so one of the people that I got to work with for a week, his name is Oscar. And the project involved, we all had these pickaxes. And so we're swinging pickaxes in the clay, just hammering the clay and trying to get chunks of clay and digging trenches in the clay so that the water wells that the Nicaraguans had learned to drill would have pipes in our trenches and that water would be piped directly into their homes. And it was so exciting. And the organization that we worked with had already served 17 villages in the area. So this was spreading like wildfire. Everybody was so excited. Well, we were there during farming season and in Nicaragua, farming is the primary source of income for the, the population. And when we arrived, it was time for the farmers to plant their crops. And so it was a really critical time and you can imagine. So what I thought was so interesting and was I was so touched by this was this gentleman, Oscar, that I got to work with had received water in his home. He was part of the 17th village while we were working on number 18. And he was the leader of this village. And he is a farmer like all of the other village you know, members. And he recruited villagers from that village to come to the 18th village and serve them during the peak week of planting season. And it was absolutely moving that they would give that up to help other individuals. And so I really wanted to know Oscar. I was so inspired by his sacrifice, but he didn't speak English. <laughs> and so what we ended up doing was learning how to communicate in other ways. I will say I learned a couple of words. I did. I learned a couple of very basic words. And he tried to learn a couple of English words. But you know what? We communicated and connected beyond language. What we learned were things like hugs are universal. You do not have to speak the same language to connect and share joy through hugs. The other thing that we really shared was laughter. You know, goofy things would happen and, and we didn't have to know what was being said. You could tell when something was funny and we would throw our heads back and share this moment of connection through laughter. And Oscar and I were together every day for a week. And so we began to develop this handshake. 
and we'd add a little step to it and add another step to it. Well, eventually this handshake had like 10 steps to it. And we did this thing over and over every day. And it was so much fun and it would make people laugh. And it was our own little language. And we would share our lunch together under the hot sun. And I would, you know, take my sandwich in half, my peanut butter and jelly and offer him half. And his wife had made tortillas from scratch and he would tear one and offer that to me. And there was so much exchange happening. There was so much connection. The joy was off the charts. Let me tell you, I learned firsthand, you do not have to speak somebody's language to have unity with them. We were united all week long. And the very last day, I will never forget. So we were hugging and, and crying and saying goodbye, you know, and Oscar brought a friend over for the first time in a week. He, it occurred to us, we could have had someone translate <laughs> and we weren't using our phones. We decided it was a no phone experience or we would have all been on Google translate. He brings a, a friend over so that this friend could communicate Oscar's thoughts with me. And the one sentence that he wanted to ask me as we said goodbye was, when are you coming back? <laughs> you wanna talk about connection? I'll tell you. I really felt the joy of connection with this man. And I have been so interested in his well-being and in the well-being of everyone that we worked with ever since. And I and I didn't speak a word of his language. So that's one story. Another story that really comes to mind as I think about connection and joy and unity. I was on a business trip by myself for a few days in a big city, and I was at a conference. And every day at mealtime, I would leave the conference and I would walk through the streets to my hotel. And it was kind of a cold spring trip and I was bundled up and it was a busy city and I would hustle to my hotel and it didn't matter what time of day it was. I would always see the same gentleman huddled in a doorway in this, in this big, huge city. And he he had a coat on. I remember he was sitting on the sidewalk, kind of in the shadows, sort of tucked away in a business doorway. And he was across the street from where I was walking. But I would see him and he was he was always there no matter what the weather. And you know, I noticed that, you know, people walked right by him. You know, we've we've kind of come to learn in some ways that if we don't look at somebody, they don't exist and we don't have to feel what they're feeling and in so many cases for self-protection or other reasons that's how we behave and i realized that i was behaving that way i had i had stayed away i saw him and i left it at that and when it occurred to me that it was the third day and that i was okay with that behavior i realized there was nothing to be okay with and here was a human being in need, and I was totally ignoring him. So I went into a coffee shop and I bought a couple of cups of hot drinks and some sandwiches and cookies and chips. And I thought, I'm gonna know this gentleman. I'm gonna, I'm gonna see if he will allow me the pleasure of knowing him. And so I crossed the street and you know, found him in the doorway and I got down at his level and I looked him in the eye and I introduced myself and asked if he would be interested in having lunch with me. And you can imagine his surprise. You can imagine the shock on his face that not only would somebody stop walking, get down at his level, look him in the eye, not only offer him some food, but sit down and share it with him and give him the gift of dignity, time spent questions asked, you know, moments of exchange. I learned his name is Jay. I learned that he wasn't from that city, that he had been married. He had a family. He was a chef. He was a trained professional and the restaurant went under and he was not a person with a lot of finances saved up and he lost his house. And shortly thereafter, his wife and his kids left him. And so here was this man, jobless, no family, no home, and he decided to get a fresh start, move to a city and, and obtain work and start over. And that was where he was when I met him. And so we sat, we talked, we laughed, you know, 
I can't say that I changed his life. I can't say that I rescued him from a life on the streets. But what I can say for sure is we shared connection. There, there was definitely joy. It was two humans from different walks of life, just really enjoying the moment of knowing each other. It was beautiful. I've been back to that city twice. It's about five hours from my house. And I drive around and I look for Jay every single time I go there. I, I'm happy, I think, to say that I haven't seen him. I'm happy because I hope that that means he's on his feet, that he has a home and that he has a job. And I hope I don't ever see him huddled in a doorway, but you can imagine that since that experience, I have been so actively drawn to the humans that I see holding signs, hiding out, laying down, being invisible to everybody. Shame on me for allowing that, but because I've experienced that joy of connection, it's something that I'm going to want to experience and share again and again. The unity <laughs> was like no other. And another story, you know, that really might help sort of explain this concept of connection and joy and unity. So <laughs> this is a personal story, so you can do with this what you want. But so I am not a big fan of doctors. And as a woman, I'm especially not excited for my annual appointment at the gynecologist. And I have been known to cancel that appointment many times. <laughs> and so one time I told myself, if I went through with that appointment and I was a good girl, I would be rewarded with ice cream afterward. And so it was after the appointment, I was looking for ice cream and the place that I wanted to go was not an option. So I ended up at a gas station convenience store. So I'm looking through the frozen case, you know, and all of a sudden I saw the treat that I wanted. It was this frozen orange round tube with a stick underneath it. The, the cover outside of it had polka dots all over it. It was like an orange stick of heaven goo and it, it's called a push-up. If you've never had a push-up, I cannot recommend them highly enough. So I grabbed this push-up, I ran and got in line. I was so excited to get to have this treat. I probably haven't had one in 20 years. And this gentleman came in the, in the building and he stood in line behind me. And, you know, I, I looked him in the eye and I smiled and he smiled back. And I noticed, you know, he had a really overgrown beard and you couldn't really see his mouth. It was pretty scruffy. He hadn't really shaved or trimmed it up in a while, but he had really nice eyes and you know, we connected and I noticed him looking at my push-up, and I, on a whim just said, do you like push-ups? And he was like, yeah, I really like push-ups. And I said, would you like this one? And he, he just was like, yeah, I would love that push-up. So I ran back and I got myself one. So we're standing in line at this little, you know, checkout counter was standing there, like two little kids at the ice cream truck, super excited to have our push-ups. We're having this great conversation. And he, he said, you know, you have a nice smile. And, and I thanked him. And he said, my philosophy is any day with more smiles than frowns is a good day. And I said, gosh, that is a great philosophy. It's so profound. It's so simple. I'm so glad that you shared that with me. Thank you for blessing me with that. And, you know, so he leaves, he went on his merry way. And so I paid for the push-ups and I was just about to exit the store when I noticed him at the door. He came back in the building and he was looking for me and he held up his push-up and he goes, you know, the guys at the soup kitchen are never going to believe I got a push-up today. And he turned around and he left. And I just thought, oh my gosh, had I just stayed in my own head thought about my own problems, the fact I didn't want to go to that doctor appointment and all the things on my to-do list, I would have missed that moment altogether. I mean, here I am spending 99 cents feeling like I had won the lottery because the connection that I had with this gentleman was like such a source of rich joy. It was beautiful. The unity that I felt with him the only regret that I have is I didn't run after him and ask him for a hug. I really, later I thought, man, I wish I could go back and ask him for a hug. So just a note to self. 
And then the last story that I want to share with you, this one was a, a pretty serious experience. Um, so yeah, I was working at a local college and I just happened to be over at the bookstore. And I normally wouldn't have been at the bookstore at this time. And while I was at the bookstore, I could hear a young woman having a conversation. It was like a one-sided conversation. And I wasn't trying to be nosy, but I couldn't help, I could not help but hear her say, if something happens to me, I would like for you to give all of my belongings to my sister. And it just landed on my heart. And I thought, oh, wow, this girl is in trouble. Something, something big is going on. So I kind of hung around that area. She was on, on the payphone. if that tells you how long ago this was. Anyone like under 20 is probably looking up payphones on YouTube right now. They don't even know what those are, but she was on a payphone. So she got off the phone and I thought to myself, do I just let it go? You know, there's that fear of, will I be intruding? This is really none of my business. And I, you know, I could have just let her walk away, but I thought to myself, there is a human being in need. And the least that I can do is ask her if she needed someone to talk to. I didn't have answers. I didn't have solutions, but I had ears. So that's what I asked her. And she seemed really surprised and actually kind of scared. And she agreed to go and talk. So we found a private place. And we ended up chatting for about two hours. And essentially what I found out was she was living nearby in an apartment with an abusive husband. And he had cut her off from having a phone in her apartment. She was no longer allowed to leave and go to work. She had not communicated with her family or friends in years. And he didn't allow her to have a vehicle of her own. And so he would go to work during the day. And the call that I overheard at the college bookstore was a call she was placing to her lawyer because she believed that he was about to take her life. And so here we are, two strangers just in this place at this time sharing a tremendous amount of fear and pain and questions. I had no answers for her. I, I was in no position to offer any true assistance in that moment. But eventually what happened was she went back to her apartment and we devised a plan where we would meet in that same place on a regular basis if it was safe for her to do so until we could explore the resources in the area and find an option for her quickly to, to get to safety. And so essentially that's what happened. It took a while, but that's what happened. And it wasn't a happy situation. You know, I would love to say it was a situation that was filled with joy. In the end, she did escape. She was able to get to um, uh, a home, a shelter for abused women. They had all the resources that she needed. I never saw her again either. And I've often wondered how she is and if she stayed safe, but there was so much connection just in that one question. Do you need someone to talk to? <laughs> you, you never know what someone's going to say when you ask that question. And so, yeah, we weren't laughing, we weren't smiling, but there was joy. There was joy in that connection and two humans coming together and doing something that was good and forming unity. This girl was absolutely alone. And I was so thankful to have been in that place at that time and, and that she was willing to share. And so, you know, unity can take so many forms and joy can come to us in so many ways. Today, you know, we talked about connection, but there's so many things that can bring joy to you. And, you know, my encouragement to you is 
if if this story, you know, sharing session has inspired you to connect to more people and feel more joy, then great. Be sure that you write that down on your list and add to that list as things come up. You know, think about other things that really make you thankful to be alive. What are some things that just make you feel like the most youiest version of you? Because that's what we're going for here. That's that's what joy feels like. And make sure that you make time for those things. You know, um, scheduling those. One of the things that I love to recommend to people is scheduling joy breaks on a regular basis because so often our calendars get filled up with so many things. And, you know, we're serving other people as well, but so often we don't make our own calendars. And they say that our calendars reflect our hearts. And while it's wonderful and good to love other people and fill up your calendar with service and, and goodness, be sure that you are allowing that same goodness to enter back into your own life. Be sure you are on your calendar, even if it's only five minutes a day, once or twice a day. And I don't know about you, but I keep hearing these studies that keep coming out about burnout and about how tired we are and you know how difficult this pandemic has been on all of us, no matter where you're watching this from, I'm sure that you can relate. And burnout has been just documented again and again. One of the easiest ways to combat burnout is by taking two five minute play breaks every single day. And so if you put that on your schedule and if you use your phone and allow an alarm to go off at the same time every day for five minutes, run outside and play or form a connection with somebody, pick up the phone and call someone that you care about, write a letter, read a few pages of your favorite book, take a nap, pet a dog, run around the house, like anything that's on your list that brings joy to you should go like on your schedule, because remember, it feels good to feel good. And we do that so that we have something to give from the joy is contagious and the goal is to give it away. And so I hope that this conversation has inspired you to do that. I hope that, you know, as you think about World Unity Week and the 99 days of peace, I hope that this concept of connecting with people who are different than you, who might even be down and out, that might be a source of joy that you haven't tapped into and that you're excited to tap into more often. And thank you for being here with me today. Again, my name is Robin Shear, and I look forward to knowing you better. And I thank you. I thank you from the bottom of my heart for spending time with me today. Thank you.